remove his hand from your life and you will see utter destruction. So we just want to praise our great and mighty God today. Amen. Amen. There's an elder who used to say before he preached, how is everybody? Amen. Amen. This year is the year of the family for Princess Park Church. We're praying that God will strengthen our families, that it will save our families. And as the family, as the families are strong in their homes, they'll be strong in the body of Christ. Amen. And when people come in, when you love in your house, and they see love in the church, they can't help but want to serve a loving God. Amen. So this year, we're praying for the family. Every sermon would be geared toward the family, and our studies will be for the family so that as we reach out to our loved ones who have not committed their lives to Christ, that they will this year. So this will be a year of praying and praying and praying. Amen. Amen. On last week, we studied from... Kings, Kings chapter 17, 1 Kings. And we studied about Elijah and the widow from Zarephath. And how this widow met Elijah. And Elijah asked her to give her all for him so that he could eat. And then after that, she was to feed her son and herself. And he'd already told her that he, she had already told him that she was eating her last meal to die. But here, this woman of faith who trusted God, who was not from the, the house of Israel, trusted a God that she did not know, and was faithful to him. And as she was faithful to him, God ensured that her increase would continue and continue and continue. What was that take-home message for us? That we put God first in our families, amen? That we would put God first, and as we put him first, then we will take care of ourselves and our families and watch God do some amazing things. Well, on today, we're going to continue our study on stewardship as we study on concerning our resources. So turn with me again to Luke chapter 12. As we have this, re this um, series on stewardship, we're going to talk about being stewards of our talents of our time and our treasures, amen? Because God wants us to be good stewards of talents, time, and our treasures. Amen. As you go back to Luke chapter 12, I want you to hold it there. As we pray, God, we've come before you as this is your time. Speak, O oh God, to us. Melt hearts, Jesus. We've been fasting and praying for 10 days. God, we're ready. We're ready to do whatever you would have of us to do. So speak to us today, God, and all that you say, we will obey. Now, God, speak through me. Let them not hear me or see me, but let your Holy Spirit be powerful in this place. What an awesome God you are. God, you gave your everything just for us. We want to give our everything back to you. Have your way, God. Keep back the hand of the devil. Keep back his little devices to keep us distracted. Let there be a, a open attention, oh God, that everyone would delight in hearing your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hold it right there at the scripture. There's a story that is told of a woman who was coming out of the store. And as she came out of the store, she saw four men in her car. This woman was packed in her purse with a gun. So she pulls her gun out and she says to the four men, I have a gun and I know how to shoot it. The men hurried up and got up out of that car and they ran away to get from her presence. And as she sat in the car, you know, she was so nervous at, at the experience. And, and she was trying to start the car, but she couldn't start the car. And then after a while, she was able to calm down. You know, after the adrenaline goes and whew, she was able to calm down. She's trying to start up her car, and she realized, this is not my car. <laughs> she was in the wrong car. 
her car was parked a few spaces down. So this woman drove to the police station to give the report of how she had carjacked these four men. And as she was giving the report to the sergeant who was taking the report, he couldn't stop from dying laughing. Because down the counter were the four men who had come in to give their report about this woman. And as they described it, she was a little woman less than five feet tall, wearing glasses with curly white hair, carrying a large handgun. This lady risking her life to get her car. Four men threatened and harm could have come if they were, uh, uh, if they had packed themselves with guns. No, no telling what would have happened. But here, this car had great value to her. And I wanna tell you this morning that the car belonged to God. It was only hers to use. For Psalms 24 says, the earth is the Lord's and all of its fullness, the world and all of us who dwell therein. So everything you have belongs to God. Who you are belongs to God. So on this morning our theme is be good stewards of all that belongs to the Lord. Our title is, it's not mine anyways, it all belongs to him. In Luke chapter 12, Jesus is talking to the disciples before a large crowd of people. Let's turn to it right now and we'll read it. We're going to start at verse 13. And then I'll give you a little history on the text. I'm reading from the New King James. Then one, of the, one from the crowd said to him, Teacher, Tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, man, who made me a judge or an arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Jesus said to them, take heed and beware of covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. Then he spoke again a parable to them saying, the ground of a certain man yielded plentifully. And he thought within himself saying, what shall I do since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there I will store all my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, so you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? The last verse, so he who lays up treasure for himself is not rich towards God. As we look at chapter 12 and we go back to verse 1, Jesus is talking to the disciples and he's before them with a large crowd of people and there's so many people that they're all over top of each other. And so Jesus always takes the opportunity to teach them because they're in front of Jesus because they want to know more about Jesus. Jesus will always teach them wonderful stories and then these were words that they never heard from anyone else. So when they came in the presence of God, they were at his feet to learn. So he started teaching them about hypocrisy. And he says, listen, don't store uh, he says, stay away from the leaven of the Pharisees. You see, the leaven was what they used in bread. And, and they will take an old patch of leaven and mix it with a new batch of leaven and will cause it to rise. And so Jesus says, hypocrisy is the same thing. Well, you might say, well, what is hypocrisy? One commentary says, is it literally an actor in a play who pretends to be something that he is not? So Jesus says, stay away from that because when hypocrisy comes inside, it spreads. And before you know it, we are only actors in the house of God. 
Jesus also started to tell them, listen, I don't want you to fear any man or what man can do to you, but I want you to fear the one who can cast you into hell. In other words, fear God rather than fear man. Then he tells them as they're sitting before him, any man who confesses him, who confesses me before all men, he will be confessed before the angels of God. But if anyone denies me, he will also be denied. What amazing stories God was presenting to them. Then he says, when you stand before the magistrates and the authorities in the synagogues, don't worry about what you're going to say or how you're going to answer, but the Holy Spirit, whom we've been studying, will teach you that very hour what you ought to say. Then within the crowd, a young man stands up and says, Jesus, teacher, Tell my brother to divide up this inheritance with, between us. And Jesus asked him the question, what, what do I have to do with that? Because normally it would be the rabbis who would handle such situations. So Jesus in his teaching decides to teach them a little bit further. In, in verse 15 he says, take heed and beware of covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of of what he possesses. In other words, you are not what you own. Huh? Some of us have to drive the best cars because when you drive the best cars, you feel good about yourself. Feel good that you're driving a nice car. I told you the story one time when I bought a BMW, I bought five years old, so don't get excited about it. Bought it, was at school. Seminary, all the pastors around, and they were hooing and awing at my car, and it was nice. It looked good. And they were shining. They were hooing and hawing. Ooh, look at Marlena. I was, I was grinning, too. I was smiling. Went out during lunch. I was tired. I laid down, took a little nap in my car, reclined back, listening to the music. Went back in the class, and we stayed there about another four hours, and I came out ready to leave. In my nice 535 XI. Don't even have a word on it, nothing but numbers. Get in my car and I push the engine button and it said click. I said, it's a new car, what is going on? Push it again, click. So now I'm on the button, what the devil is wrong with this car? Car won't start. Everybody's coming out, well I don't want them to see. Me and my nice BMW that will not start. So they were going by and said, hey, see you later. See you tomorrow. They said, well, you just wait. Y'all just waiting. So I'm going to prayer meeting close by here, so I'm going to stay in the area. Okay. Everybody leave. I go out to this car. I start calling BMW. Please come and get me. Battery died out. Listen, you are not what you own. Amen? Whether you have a big house or a little house, it makes no difference. You praise God for whatever you have. Amen? If you drive, remember those little cars that you go? It was almost like a Flintstone mobile. You got in, you had to use your feet to get it started. The you goes. I don't care if it's a you go or a Mercedes. You drive it knowing that all of it belongs to the Lord. Hmm. The Amplified Version says, watch out and guard yourselves against every form of greed. For not even when one has overflowing abundance does his life consist of, nor is it derived from his possessions. See, you are not identified by your stuff. So Jesus proceeds to tell the crowd about this rich man. He says there was a wealthy man who had a great harvest. Had a lot of crops and a plentiful ground. That as he planted, the stuff just grew up and it was so plentiful. He said, what am I, I don't even have enough room to store all of my stuff. So he says, you know what? I'm going to tear down this storehouse. I'm going to tear down this barn and make me something greater so that I have more room to store my stuff. And as he does that, he says, so you have many goods and, and good things stored up for you for many years now. That means you don't have to rest. I mean, you don't have to worry about a thing. Just rest and relax. Eat, 
drink, and be merry. In other words, I have paid my dues and, and I, have, I have gained my wealth. Now it's time for me to retire and relax and celebrate. Well, what's wrong with that story? I know some of you here, well, what's wrong with that? Because as soon as I retire, that's what I'm going to do, sit down and be merry. Well, God was looking at this man's response because there is something that the Bible did not bring out. Did he say how God used him to bless somebody else? Did you hear that? Did you hear how he took what he had to bless the poor? Did you, was that in the story? Did you hear how everything that he had, he gave back to God out of his abundance? Mm -mm, that ain't what the word says. So God says, you fool. This very night your soul is required of you. And now who will own all the things that you have prepared? Who's going to own your stuff? Don't be like that lady was so rich she left everything to them two little dogs. You remember that story? She was so rich and, and she had broken relationships. Had nobody to share so she made them two wealthy dogs. I know everybody wanted those dogs. So God says in verse 21... So it is for the one who continues to store up and hoard possessions for himself and is not rich in God. That means you're not rich in your relationship towards God. So we're going to bring out a few points and we're going to stay right at verse 21. That says, so are we who continue to store up what we gain, what's in our houses. What do we get from our wealth? Because in all that we do, we do not store up in our relationship with Christ. And let me tell you how. The first point that we're going to bring out from this story is one, we must acknowledge godly appreciation. Acknowledge godly appreciation. That means don't fall in love with your stuff. We must have a good attitude toward our wealth and know that, listen, everything I have is because God gave it to me. And if he blinked on it, it can be disappeared in a minute. In this parable, the rich man had all of his plenteous crops, but not one time did he thank God for what he gave to him. So I want to say to you this morning, all that you have is because God gave it. Yes, yeah, some of you, y'all doing real well. There's some nice cars out there, sure are. Y'all dressing nice, looking nice. And everything you have came from God. Mm -hmm. Your job, your wealth, and your health. Deuteronomy 8.18 says, And you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth. Do you know every time you get up, it's God who's giving you power to go to work. Let God turn his head on you just one time. You'll not be able to move. And I don't know if anybody been sick in here before. I remember before I went to, um, I was working on my associate's degree years ago and it was in the um, uh, profession of physical therapist assisting and I hurt my back. I don't know how I hurt my back. I went to go get something, oh, and I couldn't move. And listen, when your back hurt, you can't do anything. You, you realize your back muscles are used for everything. You're like, ah, and it was, I said, Jesus, surely I'm in school. I can't miss out. Because if God takes his hands off you, you will see utter destruction. So God gives us everything that we have. But what do we say? Not in words, we say in action, this is mine. This is my car. This is my job. This is my money. Some husbands say to wives, this is my money. Wives say to husbands, I work for that. That's my money. You can tell that to your children because that is your money. You know. Your children think that what's yours is theirs. I had to say, no, this is my money. Mm -hmm. So if you fall in love with your stuff, you will become like the rich young ruler who couldn't give up all that he had to give to the poor and went away from Jesus very sorrowful because he had much things, but his heart was not towards God. Now listen to the rich young ruler. He, he says, God, I did everything you told me to do. I kept all of the commandments. What else do I need to be saved? You see, he was in the kingdom of God. He was in the house of God. He was in the church. Serving God, living for God. Now, and, and he went before Jesus very proudly. What else can I do? 
You know, you don't ask questions like that when you're looking for the real answer. You don't, you don't say stuff like that. You say, oh, geez, please, is there anything? Help me. But see, you go boldly when you think everything is all right. And Jesus says, uh-uh-uh, give up what you have and give to the poor. And he couldn't do it. And he left the presence of God. Because he put his riches over God. You see, some of us will sell our souls to the devil. To have what we want. And miss Jesus. I don't know about you. I don't want to miss Jesus. I live in a box as long as I can have me some Jesus. Because I read somewhere that I was going to a place where the streets were gold. No, y'all don't understand. Y'all ain't never seen gold streets. Y'all act like it's something y'all heard about. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Listen. Streets of gold. Pearls on every gate. You don't even, I, I was reading the pearls. I can't even pronounce some of the pearls. God says, this is, this is where you're going to live. So you can be homeless in this life, but serve you some Jesus. So that where you're going, it's going to be a greater blessing than what you have right now. And I want to share with you, every, all of you in this place, that God has blessed you to be a blessing to somebody else. In Isaiah 58, 6 and 7, God says this is what a fast is. Because he was trying to teach the people, you know, you're doing all this fasting from food and stuff like that. This is what a real fast is. Is this not the fast that I have chosen to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free, and that you break every yoke? It is not, is it not to share your bread, that's giving, with the hungry, and that you bring to your house the poor who are cast out? Some of you ain't coming in my house. When you see the naked, that you cover him and not hide yourself from your own flesh. So we must remember that all that we have belongs to God. And why not give God our everything? Because he gave us his everything, didn't he? He went to that cross just for us. And it wasn't an easy task. Before he went, he was sweating drops of blood because of the, the weight of the sins of all of us who was on him. Did it just for us. So not only should we acknowledge godly appreciation, but we should avoid self-gratification. Avoid self-what? Gratification. So Jesus said the good life has nothing to do with being wealthy. The good life. You know, you see the people win the lotteries and then a few years they're broke. They don't have no friends. How can you be broke after somebody gave you $10 million? So the good life is not... In your wealth but he says take heed and beware of covetousness you see there are advertisers that put all these things on the TV to get our attention you won't even think about buying half the stuff you have on uh, what's that QVC you looking up there QVC before you know you got a whole house full of stuff you don't even need my sister car broke down I said we got to get another one you are single woman you can't be riding around in a raggedy car you got to have a good car so we went shopping as I we're going shopping for her, I'm looking for myself. Ooh, maybe I can have me some. I don't even need a car. Jesus blessed me. My car is paid for. I don't have any car payments. If I bought another car, I would have to get a car payment. I'm like, well, let me find me some. And then a family member said to me, said, that's why you got you to watch what you allow to go in your head. Family member said, you a pastor now. You got to drive right. I said, yeah. So you got to have you something nice and dependable. I said, yeah. You have me something nice, something dependable. And I thought about my BMW 10 years old now. So I said, well, you know, the older they get, they become a little ragged. I was thinking about that. And then the Holy Spirit whispered to me, you don't even need another car. What do you want a car for? Just because you see your sister with a car? Covetousness was inside of me. I see it. I want it and I take it. The Bible says, watch out for greed. Watch out for the things that you want. Self-gratification. Then the third thing, he says, desire spiritual sanctification. It is fine to set wealth aside for your retirement years, for that's what Proverbs says. You see the little ant goes and stores things up for the tough times. He says that's fine to do. But don't, don't put this life first and neglect the kingdom of God. So God says, I want you to put me first. 
The rich fool stole up treasures for himself on this earth, but he did nothing for the kingdom of God. So what is God asking of us today? He wants us to store what we have into his kingdom. You say, I don't have much. Uh-huh, he wants that. Matthew 6, 19 through 21 says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. If you don't put your treasures into the kingdom of God, your heart will be right here on this earth. And you will desire a heart just like the rich young ruler. So this morning, where is your heart? The word of God says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. God is a God of love. So if he gives you something, guess what he wants you to do? He wants you to share it. So two things he wants you to do. With your riches, God asks you to provide for your fellow man. Provide for your fellow man. I should hear more amens than that. Provide for your fellow man. Matthew 25, 34 through 36. He says, then the king will say to those on his right hand, come, you blessed of my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and what? You gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. You see, God says, you did it. You did it. You did it. And, and, and the parable was so, so powerful. The people said, well, when, God, when did we do that? He says, when you've done it to the least of them, you've done it unto me. Amen. When I give to you, I want you to bless other people. God says, man, don't buy that car because you won't be able to bless other people. I give to you to bless you so that you can bless somebody else. God says, take care of my people. The poor you will have with you always. Take care of my people. When you've done it to the least of them, God says, you've done it unto me. Amen. Love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. That's the first thing he wants you to do. The second thing he wants you to do is provide for his temple. Amen. Help me in this place. Amen. Take care of your church. Amen. Oh, nice. Y'all give just like that too. Amen. That's exactly what we get. Provide for the temple of God. Luke 21 says, and he looked up and saw Listen, Jesus was in the, in the temple. He looked up. This is Jesus looking at what's going on. He looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts into the treasury. And he saw also a certain poor little widow putting in two mites. And he said to somebody, truly I say to you that this poor widow has given her all. For all of the rich gave out of their abundance. But she has given out of her poverty. And put all of her livelihood in this offering. She gave all that she had. And it was only a little bit. God wants you to give your all. And he's going to bless you. He used, we, God established what he's called a tithing system. And it was established way back with Abraham in Genesis chapter 14. And in the Old Testament, the tithing system was used to provide for the Levites. As they ministered in the temple. Paul says in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, that the tithing still takes care of the house of God. Amen. He says, do you know that those who minister to holy things eat of the things of the temple? And those who serve at the altar partake of the offerings of the altar? Even so, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should live from the gospel. Amen. Amen. So God has set up this system that as he gives to you, he wants you to bless him. Listen, he's giving you 100. And he says, all you have to do is give back to me 10. You get to keep the 90. Oh yeah. If y'all could see yourself. And when I look at the reports, that's exactly what it looks like. God 
has a work for us to do, but he needs our help. And every church, do you know you don't have to go out selling fish dinners to raise money for church? He says, I bless my people with the monies already. Everything that I have, I've already given them. And I want them to learn how to be good stewards. So that when I bless, when they give back to me, I will bless them. Amen. Do you understand? God will bless you. Oh, please. Uh, any, bless, any blessed people in the house? Anybody know what I'm talking about? When you've given God your all, how he gives back to you. Then I need some help from the blessed people. Y'all can't be sitting there. The other folk need to be cons- need to be encouraged by the blessed people. If you've been blessed, y'all to show the word of God says, "Let the redeemer of the Lord say so." Let those who are blessed say so. I say, "Have y'all been blessed?" Yeah, I'm blessed. So God says that those who preach the gospel, their homes must be taken care of. Their livelihood must be taken care of. And so He teaches in in Malachi chapter eight: Will a man rob God yet? You have robbed me. Can you imagine robbing God? Mm-hmm. We do it all the time. And he, and he says, well, where have we robbed you? He says, you robbed me in your tithe and your offerings. Now, when God commands us to do things, he wants us to obey. And when you don't obey the, the, the voice of God, there are consequences. You understand? Consequences. One of the consequences, he says, that you are cursed with a curse. For you have robbed me even this whole nation. But bring all the tithe into the storehouse. Well, what is this storehouse? In the Seventh-day Adventist church, we are a global, a worldwide church. And they set up a system that the, the, the pastors are hired by a conference and not an individual church. If we were an individual church, the storehouse would be this house. But because I'm not employed by this church, because y'all could find me in a minute. Y'all could lay me off. Y'all could reduct my pay. I'm hired by the conference so that I get the same money, praise God, every month. The same monies. And so as, as the storehouses are provided to take care of the pastors, we, when we give, we give to our conference level that has, that has become our storehouses so that it will take care of the ministers of God. You got me? That's what our storehouse is. So he says, if you give to me and you are obedient, there is a promise. What did I say? A promise. Now, I want y'all to get a little bit excited because y'all can't keep looking at me like you are right now. So I'm going to give you the promise. The promise says, and if you try me, if you prove me, look, I didn't say it, but it says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will be not enough room for you to receive. Now, some of y'all, y'all ain't even excited yet. Like y'all seen windows of blessings. God says, I will pour out the windows of heaven. Now, I, he said something about doors. He ain't said anything about windows. But he's going to pour out window, through the windows of heaven blessings just for you. And, and listen to what he says. You know, every time you try to be faithful to God, then the car breaks down. And then the, the, the gas get cut off. Then the lights get cut off. The children say, I got holes in my shoes. All these things try to happen when you're serving God. But this is what he says. I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes. That he will not destroy the fruit of your ground. Nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field. Guess what? Says the Lord of hosts. God said it. And if he said it, you can believe it. Well, I got another promise. He said in Luke chapter 6, he says, give and it will be given to you. Good measure. Press down. Shaking together. And running over will it all be into your bosom. For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. So how you give to God will be given back to you. If you're stingy, if you're stingy, help me in this place. If you're stingy, that's why your lights get cut off, because you're stingy. That's why the baby need a pair of shoes, because you're stingy. Maybe got a light bill due. Even got a gas bill too, because you're stingy. But when you give to God, he'll bless you. You serve a rich God. You serve the God says, I own the beast in the field, in the forest, and the cattle on a thousand hills. He didn't say, I own a thousand cattle. He says, I own the cattle on a thousand hills. And what's mine, I want to give to my children. If they will but trust me. 
You see, materialism corrupts the mind. Come on, organist, I'm finishing. And it causes people materialism. Materialism. You, you do whatever you, you whatever it requires to get what you want. But materialism corrupts the mind and it causes people to trust in what they own versus trusting in God. So therefore, when you get paid and you don't have enough money, you will take your money and pay your bills and you still don't have enough. And you will leave God to the side because you don't trust him enough. Now you look to you to be your provider. God says, I am God. And there is none beside me. Whatever you need, I have for you. All you got to do is ask me. Trust me. I will come through for you. You are my children. He says, how much will an earthly father give to his children? And I love you. I gave my life. I will provide for you. But I need you to trust me. Trust the Lord, church. Trust the Lord. This is the year of the family. What greater way to lead God, to lead your family to God? This is family. From now on, we're putting God first. He's going to be first in this house going to be first in our lives and teach your children you give them allowance teach them how to give back to God now listen I want you to understand something do you know God doesn't need your money have you ever heard Jesus saying can you loan me five dollars I'll pay you back you ever heard Jesus say that because he owns it all he doesn't need it he wants you to know that you need him and as you know that you need him, he'll give back to you. And he'll increase it abundantly. Thank somebody preaching with me. He'll give it to you abundantly. He says, trust me. Trust me. Don't covet. Don't covet the things that are not necessary for you. If you can't afford it, don't buy it. If you can't afford it, don't charge it. Listen, use what God has given you to bless him and to bless somebody else. And he'll show you great and precious promises. He is true to his word. Everything that you have belongs to the Savior. And if you know it belongs to him, you, why not be willing to share with him and his people? Because God is going to try you. You got five dollars left. And you're going to see somebody who has no food to eat. Are you going to say, this is my only $5? God says, I want you to be a blessing to somebody. You got to wait to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit, but you got to be in a position where you can hear the Spirit. Some of you don't even know when the Spirit is talking because there's no connection. But when you're connected, God will say, I want you to give this. You're like, Let me get that. Last year, I got my income tax. I had plans. God says, I want you to bless somebody. I want you to go and buy them this. Amen. And it took over half my money. And I said to my family member, God did that because I couldn't have done that. Amen. It cost a lot. When I say a lot, I lot. There were several numbers in there on those digits. It cost a lot. Amen. Because God wants to show me, if you trust me, yes. I will bless you. And so I had ha happened to ask God, God, show me how to give even more. Because he gave me a spirit of giving. I said, show me how to give even more. And don't you know God will try you? And before you know, you don't have anything. But every time my hands are open and it looks like I don't have anything, God feels it and gives me more and more and more. And I see the windows open. Because he's true to his word. God says, if you love me, you'll take care of my people. And you'll take care of my house. When you love me, well, God, I only make $200. Give me first. And I will stretch the rest. I will stretch it. You won't run out of gas. The children wear shoes from five years. They still, the feet growing, but they can wear the same pair of shoes. Without the toes curling up, God got a way to make it work. This year, this year, the year of the family, year of the family. Joshua said in 24, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen. Me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Are you willing 
to give God your everything. He went to a cross naked. He left everything just for you. Just for you. Can't you give him 10%? He didn't even ask you for 30, 40, 50. He didn't even ask you. He said, just give me 10. And then a sacrificial offering. And I will show you my great power. I will bless your family. Try me. Try me. Because, listen, statistically, one out of three people are faithful in their giving. One out of three. Can you imagine if Prentice Park went to two out of three? And three out of three. There would be nobody calling uh, to, the, to the poor for, hey, pastor, I need. Uh-uh-uh-uh. Because he said in Deuteronomy 28 that I will make you the lender and not the borrower. You'll be the head and not the tail. I'm going to bless you when you come in and I'm going to bless you when you go out. God's word is true. He's faithful. He said, trust me. Trust me. Close your eyes. Close your eyes. It deals with money. People are very sensitive. So I want your eyes closed. I want your eyes closed. You are struggling. Right now, your material things have been put before God. Well, you said, Pastor, what do you mean? What do you mean? If you are not faithful in giving an honest tithe and offering, you have put your material things and your needs before God. In other words, you're saying, God, I love you, but I don't trust you enough to provide for me. So I'm going to handle it myself. Every eye is closed. Every eye is closed. Talk to God. Talk to him. Talk to him right now. And after you talk to him, I'm going to pray for you. Talk to him. Get it straight. Get it straight. We've been fasting and praying for the anointing of the Holy Ghost in our lives. And God says, I'm going to show you the things that are in you so that I may take those things away. Because he cannot feel us if we are flawed. God wants to fill us with his spirit. Talk to him, church. Tell him, says, God, I'm weak. I want to do better. I want to be faithful. I want to trust you as my God. Now it's time to pray. God, how awesome you are. You never fail us. It is the enemy who wants us to put our hope in material things versus putting our hope in you. Because he knows when we're not faithful to you, we don't trust you. And if we don't trust you, we're certainly not going to serve you. Oh yeah, we'll come to church. We might read a scripture here, there, or say a prayer. But we will only have a superficial experience with you. When you are calling us to have a deep relationship with you. To know that if I lose my job, I have a king who owns the universe. And all I have to do is call on his name. And he will come through for me. God, we're here today because we want to change. God, change Prentice Park. So that it's not one third of the people trying to take care of the church. And we need to do ministry, but it's not enough. God, it's not enough. And those who give find themselves giving over and over and over. And others do not. So God, move in us. Change us. Not grudgingly, but with the joy of the Lord. Because you've been so good to us. Let us, God, be good to you. God, we thank you. We thank you. As our heads continue to stay bowed, there's somebody here 
You need Jesus in your life in a mighty way. You need Jesus. You need Jesus. You're saying, God, I want you to change my life. Change my life. You want to be baptized. I want to be clear. You want to be baptized so that God can change your life and you publicly tell everybody, I've given my life to the Lord. I want to serve and be a part of this ministry because I see God doing great things. If that is your desire, raise your hand right now. Raise your hand. You want to do great things for God. You want God to move in your life and to move in your heart. Move in this place, Holy Ghost. Move right now, Holy Spirit. There's someone here. Praise the Lord. I see your hand, sister. You want God to do something awesome in your life. He's given his everything for you and he says, I want you to give your all to me. Is there anybody else? Anybody else you want? You want Christ. Was that your hand, sister? Was that your hand? Praise the Lord. For Praise the Lord. This is a, 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 a request for baptism. You want to publicly tell the world, I don't care. I love me some Jesus. And he's in my life. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. Church, we need to rejoice. There's three waiting for baptism now. Three. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. Let us pray. God, thank you. That is only the beginning of what you're going to do. God, you're going to do mighty things in us as we surrender our lives to you. God, more than anything, we want to be at your feet. When that trumpet sounds and when you come in that sky and the dead in Christ will rise. God, just as those who are alive and remain will be caught up in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. God, we can't wait for that day. Hearts are hurting here. Hearts are broken here. God, we can't wait for that day. Fix us, Jesus. Fix us. Fix us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Give God a praise. Give Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. He's been awesome. Praise the Lord. Not me. Praise the Lord. Close your eyes.